Hello, my name's Simon. I'm one of the elders here at Bethel Church, Albury. And I'm going to jump right in and ask you a question. And it's a question that wise folks and philosophers have debated over for as long as we can remember. What came first, the chicken or the egg? Now, if your answer is the egg, then that begs the question, how did it get there? And where's the chicken that laid it? But if your answer is the chicken first, then that begs the question, where did it hatch from? since there was no egg. There's only one right answer. And it's one of those questions that can have you going round in circles. Each time you answer the question, you're left with another unanswered question. However, for those of us who actually believe the Bible as God's written word, uh, this is not a problem. See, once we add the Bible into the equation, it fully answers the question. Right in the book of Genesis, in the first two chapters, we see that God formed every creature out of the ground and then they reproduced just as he made the first man and woman then they reproduced and so the answer from the bible point of view to the age-old question what came first the chicken or the egg it's the chicken first but not all are willing to believe or receive the bible as god's written word and so they reject the one thing that could answer life's big questions and therefore they reduce to chasing the tails and going around in circles never actually arriving at a satisfactory answer. Now today in our fourth and final talk in this series on discipleship, I want, I want to challenge us, or even to dare us, to consider giving Jesus, who is the living word of God, access to all areas of our lives and involving him in everything we do. That's bringing his person, his wisdom, his knowledge, his light into all of life's dilemmas that we face. In short, bringing Jesus into the equation that's the title of this talk and i want to demonstrate not only by looking at the interactions of jesus with his disciples as recorded in the bible but also by personal testimony how he's helped me when i faced personal dilemmas and needed to get jesus involved so that i'm not just basing his talk on bible knowledge but also on personal experience where i've proved him because sometimes in life we can end up going around in circles and repeating the same mistakes and getting no closer to a solution for the dilemmas we find ourselves in. But, and that's because there's a vital element missing from the equation. Yeah. The idea of an equation is this. Both sides must be equal in order to bring about a solution. The problem has to be met with the answer. Confusion, confusion has to be restored with order. And if there's a vital element missing from the equation, it cannot be solved. Here's an example of an equation that looks to answer one of life's big questions. It's called the Blue Monday equation. You may have seen it before. And it appears to give a satisfactory answer as to why the third Monday in January is the most depressing day of the year. There are a lot of factors to consider in why it's the most depressing day of the year. It's dark, it's cold, some are in debt from Christmas. Most people get paid at the end of the month, so by the third Monday in January, the money's run out. The summer holidays are as far away as you can think. Most divorces are filed in January more than any other month of the year because they hold it together over Christmas and file it in January. And many New Year resolutions and diets have failed by this. And add to that, that the overindulgence of Christmas now finds itself in pounds manifesting itself. And all these elements seem to satisfy that question. Here's another quote. This one is also one of my favourites. If your outgoings exceed your incomings, your upkeep will be your downfall. I like that one. The equations are a way of bringing a satisfactory answer to difficult situations, you know, restoring order and calm, resolving problems, and life's full of them. And we see it time and time again, particularly with Jesus and his disciples. But because he was there, he was able to bring about a solution to everyday life's concerns. A couple of examples in John. In John 6, we see there was a great storm at sea and Jesus was asleep in the boat. And these experienced fishermen were in fear of their lives, so they came to Jesus. And Jesus was able to bring about great calm, the Bible says, of the storm. The wind and the waves even obeyed him. 
because he was there, because he was involved. And there was another incident, probably worse than that, the wine had run out of the wedding. And they didn't know what to do, but because Jesus was there, they got him involved. And it came about that the wine they tasted, that Jesus had made from water, was better than any wine they'd ever tasted. That shouldn't surprise us. When we add Jesus into the circumstance, he brings about order, since, after all, he holds all creation together. I mean, look at what this verse says in Colossians chapter 1. Through him, that's Jesus, God created everything. In the heavenly realms and on earth, he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else. And he holds all creation together. So since he's in all creation, holding it all together, even the things we can't see and understand, it makes no sense, therefore, to exclude him, but every sense to include him in our everyday lives. Jesus wants to be involved in our everyday lives. He wants to be involved in the dilemmas that we find ourselves in. The question is that whenever life throws a curveball, and when things don't add up, do we go for the phone or the throne? Now, we know that discipleship is a journey, and the fact that Jesus called us to follow him means that it's a journey. And it's stuff that we're only going to learn en route uh, through real-life events. Some things that are common to all, and some things are just going to be unique to us as individuals but the destination however is the same for us all namely that our character is formed into the image of Christ and that's the one who we're following now we still have unique and varied personalities and we can tell from creation around us that God loves variety but it's our character that goes through the process of reworking and the Bible calls this process sanctification it's something that's ongoing and something that happens en route. Now as each stage is complete, it's got benefits both to us and to those around us, not to mention that it does our Heavenly Father proud. And there may be times on that journey when we face personal dilemmas, when we call out to the Lord for help, and we should, but we don't always get the answer that we're expecting. And that's because God may have a higher agenda in mind, a bigger picture. There's a record in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul the Apostle calls out to the Lord three times to remove this so-called thorn in his side, and speaking metaphorically. And the Lord answers by saying, My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now once Paul understood this, it completely changed his outlook on life. And that's worth keeping in mind. If there's an issue that's not resolved as you like, Does he have a higher agenda? Worth asking that question. But don't just assume it though. Keep asking him the question. Paul asked three times, didn't he? And in order to get to know Jesus and what's on his mind, you must, say must, you must ask questions. Not only that, you must listen out for the answers. And most of the time that will come through his written word, which is the Bible. So in order to increase our chances of hearing, we must read it or listen to it. And other times, it's going to come through thoughts that are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And that's always going to line up with the Bible and the character of Jesus. You see, the Bible is the written word of God and Jesus is the living word of God. Therefore, they're always going to agree. And that's that's something that takes practice. But if you remember that, you'll get it right more often than not. And the leadership of this church are always here to help anyway. And eventually you get to the point where Jesus said in John 10 that my sheep know my voice. But remember, it's a journey, one that transforms us season by season. In one part of the Bible, it speaks of going from glory to glory. In John's Gospel, John the Baptist puts it like this. He must increase, but I must decrease. And in another place... It says, it's no longer I that lives, 
but Christ that lives in me. And again, my life is now hidden with Christ in God. This runs right through the entire Bible. Discipleship is a journey of transformation where our character, not our personality, is continually in a process of being made ready for eternity with him. And a job will never be finished in this life. But it continues until we see him face to face. So it's no good asking the question, are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? No. We're never going to be there yet. But remember this, he who will begun a good work in you will continue the job until the day of Jesus Christ. That's until we die and go to be with him or until he returns, whichever comes first. And when we see him, the Bible says, we shall be like him. So don't get into a panic that you could be cut off from life at any time. Your character is nowhere near ready. You're never going to be ready this side of heaven. What matters is that you're on the journey. And the good news is that Jesus himself, who is the author and perfecter, the finisher of our faith, has sent his Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and to bring everything he said to remembrance. And if we add to that his promise that he will be with us to the end of the age if the church obeys his commandment to make disciples, you'll find that we're more than well equipped for this journey of discipleship. Even though it's a fact that we're going to encounter problems en route, just as Jesus' early disciples did, but because Jesus was part of the equation, the issues were resolved. I want us to briefly look at two more examples in the Bible where Jesus was brought into the equation and more than resolved the issue. We've already looked at Jesus turning water into wine and calming a storm, both of these recorded in the Gospel of John. But let's go to John's Gospel again and look at the feeding of the 5,000. It says this, Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him. And he said to Philip, where will we buy bread for these people to eat? But he said this to test Philip because he knew what he was about to do. Now that's important, he knew what he was about to do. Philip answered, 200 days wages worth of bread is not enough for each one to receive, even a little. When we know the story, because Jesus was involved in the equation, 5,000 families were fed on that day. This next one is one of my favourites as far as uh, provisional miracles are concerned. And this one's found in Matthew's Gospel. It says, when they arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the temple tax went up to Peter and said, does not your teacher pay the half shekel? Peter answered, yes. And when he had come, when he had came home, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom the earthly rulers collect duties and taxes? From sons or from strangers? When Peter said from strangers, Jesus said to him, then the sons are exempt from taxation. You see, Jesus knew that there was something on Peter's mind and he chose to bring it out by a question. At the same time, he was disagreeing with the taxation of his own people. However, he went on to make provision for it and he says this, however... So that we do not offend them, go to the sea, throw in a hook, and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you will find a shekel. Take it and give it to them to pay the temple tax for you and me. Now, this is what amazes me about this event, this miracle. First of all, the sea is a large place and there are many fish that swim in it. Second, Jesus would have to know where a particular fish would be at a particular time that Peter cast his hook in for the first time. And third, Jesus would have to know that some unlucky fish would have stuck in its mouth the exact money, that's one shekel, required to pay the two uh, half shekels for the temple tax for both of them. What are the odds of that? And this is what we can learn from these. In life's dilemmas, first of all, Jesus anticipates them. Second, he already knows what he's going to do. And third, 
he has infinite knowledge of where things are at any given time. So it's going to make sense to add into any equation. That brings me nicely to a personal experience as disciples of Jesus, because he still works in our lives today. The year um, before the pandemic hit, I was working for the same company I work at now at the time of this recording. But the role that I was in then was more sales orientated than it is now in my current role. Now, those of you who are familiar with the sales environment will know the pressures to perform month after month. There are targets that must be hit. You're only as good as your last result, I keep saying. And it doesn't matter about past awards or past achievements, it's all about the net. And those of you who follow, who follow football will know that a manager who gets a few bad results in a row, they're suddenly under the microscope, whatever their past achievements are. Well, this was me. Not through idleness or lack of experience um, or lack of effort, if you missed your target three periods in a row, you were highlighted to those above and you were put on a performance improvement program. We call it a PIP for short. And I remember thinking, I don't want to go on a PIP. That, that lumps me in with the lazy people. And then people that go off sick when they're not sick. And then we come in late and go home early. And then we don't look after the customers. I remember... I was having a mini meltdown, like the ones that you have at the start of the Psalms. And after I finished my mini meltdown, I prayed a short and honest prayer. And I believe that was a point that invited Jesus into the equation. The prayer went something like this. Lord, I've got nothing left. It's the last but one day of the period and I don't know what to do. Please help me, because I'm not enjoying this job anymore. And that's what I said, from the heart, something like that. Now, not long after I said that, um, I had what I can only describe as a loud thought. And he said this, answer your phone. Now, I'm not, it's not the sort of thing I would think of, because I've grown to hate my phone over the years. For me, the, the main purpose of owning a phone was so that you could turn it off. That people would always want a piece of me, they always waste my time with nonsense. I'm talking about a work phone now. And it would always cost me something, and when it went off, it was never, ever anything good. But here was this loud thought cutting across my thinking, and it was unique to my circumstance. So I thought to myself, apart from all the things that had just gone through my mind regarding answering this stupid phone, I thought, what's the worst that can happen if I pick it up? I could always hang up if it's a survey or a PPI claim company. And so I decided I was going to answer the phone. And guess what the first call was? It was a machine breakdown and I was not happy. However, the next call was one from our biggest customers, one of our biggest customers. And this is what he said to me. He said, I was given your name by your office staff. I thought, here we go. And he said, he went on to say, I'm opening a new paint shop that will cater for cars worth three million pounds each. I'd heard that you have machines in our existing sites. What do you advise? And how soon can you get them here? I couldn't believe my ears. Bon and cheese. I was over the moon. The next day, which was the last day of the period, uh, the breakdown that I was meant to do was passed over to someone else. And I was busy that day installing three of our machines, which saw me hit three months' target in one hit. And so I was able to leave that role and a high reputation intact and take up another role as service engineer within the company, a role which I'm better suited to and more happy in. You see, involving Jesus in all areas of our lives makes a difference. And so I want to end with this. I want to end with a challenge and a question. The challenge is this. Are you willing to give Jesus access to all areas of your life, to involve him in every equation? I mean, why exclude him is able to bring light into your darkness, since after all, he's a light to the world. And why exclude him is able to bring peace to your unrest, since he's the Prince of Peace, or bring direction because he is the way, 
or bring provision because he's the bread of life. I could go on, but you get the idea. And second, I'd like to ask this question. Do you know him personally? Not the knowing at a distance through someone else or by filtered second-hand reports like we think in our celebrities. Or even I've met him once and exchanged a few words like a breathing counter when you get him a signed autograph. But the guards down, quality time, real conversation, honest exchange level. Because that's the level we grow at season by season when we see him firsthand working in us and through us and as we give him access to all areas, adding him to all our equations. Now I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray as we close this series of talks on discipleship, just in case there are any listening who have only known Jesus second hand or at a distance, but also for those who want to give Jesus access to all areas of their life, I want to invite you to go in deeper. So I want you to say this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, you already know me. I want to know you. I choose to follow you to put my trust in you. Please help me to follow you closely so that nothing gets in between us. Help me to show others who you are so that they may follow you also. Amen. If you said that prayer, we'd certainly like to hear from you. I'm sure there'll be contact details at the end of this um, video. So God bless you. See you soon.